Senator Lowenthal? Here. Senator Hancock? Senator Huff? Here. Assemblymember Fuller? Assemblymember Brownlee? Assemblymember Torlickson? Yes. Scott Harvey? Present. William Ellerby? Here. Lynn Green? Here. Cynthia Bryant? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. And as usual, we'll leave the roll open on our votes for our members. I think that we definitely won't have Senator Hancock today, and Assembly, Assembly Member Brownlee may or may not make it, and I'm not sure about Assemblywoman Fuller, but we'll leave our votes open until they can come unless somebody objects. A um, couple notices about the agenda today. Um, first of all, I'm planning to have this be my record-breaking shortest meeting of the State Allocation Board since I have been chair and we will finish the binder. Um, first of all, tab 13 will not be heard. That item was on there to kind of as a placeholder in case we had to make any changes to the priorities and funding regulation. But not only do we not have to make changes, I was just informed that OAL is going to post them and adopt them as final tomorrow, so we're in good stead with those regulations. Um, we're also removing tabs 8, 10, and 11 which are all related to appeals of decisions made by OPSC. And those are coming out for several reasons, which I just wanted to highlight for a second, because it highlights a couple of flaws in our appeal system. First of all, I think we need to have a policy on how and when you can withdraw appeals. And I think that's something that Senator Hancock's subcommittee is going to consider and will consider, but I just wanted to mention that. Second, we have to do a better job of giving our stakeholders um, more consistent application of appeals. And we can kind of address that in three ways. First of all, yesterday I talked to the director of DGS, and he's going to consider that question in the context of the 90-day report that DGS is working on related to OPSC, and I'll talk about that in a second. OPSC is going to immediately implement a better notification system and begin working sooner with districts with pending appeals, and Ms. Silverman will talk about that in her executive officer's report. And, and finally, stakeholders need to take responsibility for looking at the workload, that three-month workload that we've been putting in, the, in, the, in our documents. It came to my attention that the May workload was actually never posted on the website last month, it was a, which was an error, but we didn't get a single comment from anybody that it was missing, which means that no one's really probably noting, noticing it. So it would be really helpful to me if you all would look at that that document, and if you have concerns about the agenda or the workload, or maybe we should call it pre-agenda, um, let me just contact me directly, because I want to make sure that we don't have misunderstandings about when something's going to be heard and when it's going to be eligible. Um, after consulting with Senator Lowenthal, I'm also removing tab 9, which is the administrative cost item. As, you're, as you all know, last week uh, Assemblywoman Brownlee conducted a hearing about our program and, and DGS's other chief deputy, Stephen Amos, was testified, testified there about that they're about to undertake a 90-day review of OPSC operations. Um, DGS has committed to work with the State Allocation Board during this 90-day review to further define its relationship with the board. And this will include an update and a chance for input on the 90-day plan, and it also includes will also include a report on planning for next year for this program. Mr. Amos was unable to be here today due to previously, previous travel commitments, but he'll be here in August so we can continue that discussion. And I think all of us recognize that we have a shared responsibility for this program, and I, I think that this 90-day report will go a long way in getting us going. So I want to thank Ms. Brownlee. I think Sophia's here. Um, thank you for having the hearing, and thank you to DGS for undertaking the review. But mostly, I want to thank the staff at OPSC all of you do such a good job, and you continue to work hard for the people of California. So I just want to say thank you once again. So are there any comments on that, Ms. Senator Lowenthal? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, as a board member that's engaged in uh, some pretty frank discussions and disagreements about the role of the State Allocation Board, I'd like to also speak to some comments that were made at the recent Assembly Education Committee Department of General Services Oversight hearing. Um, I'm aware that a statement was made by a witness questioning the commitment level of the Office of Public School Construction staff, and I want to make clear as a board member, I have only the highest regard uh, for the work that OPSC staff does and the level of commitment that has been demonstrated by their staff as they try to work under some very trying circumstances, and I'm here to say I applaud the staff of the OPSC. Thank you. Anything else on that? All right, then, so we'll move to tab three, the executive officer statement, Ms. Silverman. Yes, uh, thank you, Cynthia. 
I would like to, um, obviously, Cynthia shared some great news with, with all of us today that uh, we wanted to give you an update on a regulation package uh, with respect to priorities of funding, but there's not much to report other than it's stamped and it'll be heading over to Secretary of State's office tomorrow. So that's great news for this program. And we also wanted to provide you an update in priority funding, um, which is this pilot project that we're kicking off. And the request received to date is 418 projects for approximately $1.3 billion. So that's great news. These requests have come within um, 420 school districts, but yet still dis school districts are still encouraged to um, submit requests and up until June 28th, um, which is the final filing date for those requests. Again, you know, it's, it's a great statement for the program and shows reflects the need. So again, I encourage districts to still apply. And we also want to provide you an update on overcrowding relief grant program regulata regulatory amendments. OEL has approved the regulatory amendments and the effective dates of the regula regula regulations are June 23rd, 2010. And with regards to seismic activity, given to the recent seismic activity that has been reoccurring in the Imperial County office uh, in the area, staff is in the process of scheduling a meeting with CALIMA, which is California Emergency Management Agency, to discuss emergency response process. And the goal is potentially invite CALIMA to present at a future meeting with regards to emergency response plan and planning and preparedness. So again, to circle back as far as what our role is with response to some of these disasters, and again, um, we w definitely want to provide districts a level of understanding of what our role is, what their role is, and how the state m monitors that, that process. As respect to the uh, tentative workload plan, again, for transparency purposes, we have been um, providing you a 90-day workload and attach that is attached to your executive officer statement. Again, as future planning, um, we also want to add another layer of transparency is to provide you our log, the appeals log that we receive. Um, so obviously we work from this log, we log these appeal requests in and moving forward, forward progression, as we move along, we, we conduct our meetings and the appeals actions are taken, then these folks move up to the list. So. Again, making that a transparent process, understanding the dates they submitted those requests and uh, for an appeal. So again, in the process of date order, that's how we're moving these, this process along. So again, and adding another layer of transparency and understanding there's definitely flaws in how we've been conducting this process, but we're very much engaged with trying to provide additional communication to our school district members, maybe obviously providing a letter in advance saying we received your request, offering an opportunity to meet with us early um, as opposed to later. Um, and again, that's our efforts that we'll be moving forward, we'll be working with the chair and again with the action plan or the 90 day plan, incorporate some definitely needed process improvements in this area. So with that, I finish my segment. Did you want to mention why you're um, sitting at the table with two new people and not with oh, your yes. yeah. Well, as sidekick? You, yeah, my sidekick, my sidekick is, uh, I, I definitely enjoy m my partner, um, Juan Morales, as you know, is uh, not present with us today. And, you know, he works very hard for this office and very much dedicated in our efforts and applaud him for everything he does. And so, absent <laughs> that today, um, I actually called him on Saturday. and. Uh, in the event we were just having a side conversation about, well, leave your phone on because your wife is expected any day now and so should the event, if your phone rings, obviously we'll tell everybody you have to leave. But that, it, that didn't happen. So it actually, he had a baby, early Father's Day gift um, come Saturday evening. So welcome um, baby Camilla. A little and early. We thought we'd have one here today, but yeah. we don't. So right. that's why the agenda's gonna be so short and we have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. so we definitely miss his presence, but in any uh, way, he needs to be with his family. So, his congratulations. Re 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 it's Camille S. A. B. Morales. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be Camille Valentina. O. P. S. C. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, so moving on to tab four, the consent agenda. Madam Chair, I don't know if you intentionally skipped it, but the minutes haven't been approved yet. Oh, I, I did not intentionally skip it, but let's go ahead to tab two, the minutes. Yes. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Is there a motion? Any public comment on the minutes? Oh, Lyle, okay. <laughs> we may have a change here. Yeah, 
Thank you. Lyle Smoot representing Los Angeles Unified. I don't know that it would necessitate a change to the minutes, but there's a question that came up after last month's discussion about the high performing incentive grant program, and there was a project information worksheet included in the packet of materials that went to uh, OAL that, it, that has a bunch of questions that can't be answered. And so I was hoping that uh, I rewatched the tape of the meeting last month, and there was a lot of discussion about the fact that it was a work in process, the PIW portion of it. And I was hoping that, in fact, you could direct staff to just pull that form back and ask for it to be sent to the implement implementation committee and resubmitted because there is some information on there just just can't be answered at the time of the fund release request. The first time it's submitted it has to be submitted. And it just creates, it either creates a situation where a district has to put down information that they just made up <laughs> or something to that extent. And I, I'm hoping you just pull that, just pull that one form back from the package and send it to the committee and have it, it could be done um, in a month pretty easily. Silverman. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and, and just a point of clarification, um, the worksheet itself is, is an informal worksheet. It's not a part, it's not a reg, it's not an official form, but it, it is a worksheet that we use internally. So um, I know we've heard comments about additional clarification. I think we, we had an implementation committee meeting, so it's, it's there right now currently, so we're working on refining that. So it's not that. part of the regulatory package? I don't believe so. Because I was, I was under the impression it's part of the regulatory package. It's, in, it's incorporated by reference as a document. It is not part of the reg package per se. So the document itself did not go to OAL? That's correct. Okay. Okay, then. So is there, is there a motion on the minutes? I move. Second? Second. All those in, do we need to call the roll? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now moving on to tab four, the consent calendar. Ms. Silverman? Yeah, the consent agenda, excuse me, the consent agenda is uh, there for your approval. So we can take a vote. Mr. Dr. Ellibrey. Madam Chair, I'm going to recuse myself from all the items that are related to Sacramento City Unified School District. Um, all other items I'll be voting yes. Okay, duly noted. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, moving on to the um, uh, tabs five and six, the status of funds, releases and status of funds. Yeah, if I can draw your attention just at page 142, tab five, um, what we have been presenting is the liquidation of uh, the cash we received in the various bond sales since 2009 through March 2010. And if I can draw your attention to stamp page 144. The drawdown we want to, sh to share with you as far as this month's activity through June 1st is we've expended down $51.8 million this month and I, and I wanted to clarify a statement that I made last month. Um, typically what we try to do is provide the board an update as far as what uh, fund releases we've released to date and so I wanted to clarify obviously that was a misstatement last month but what I want to share with you is again moving forward is we want to share with you the fund releases that we have dispersed from June 1st to June 21st, which will report, reflect on next month's report. We actually have quite been a successful month in releasing funds. Uh, we released 96 fund releases for the total of $438 million. So that's the cumulative amount we will report next month. So, but although what's reflected in this report from May 1st through June 1st is only 51.8 million. But again, the success is next month we'll have a larger drawdown. So that's good news for this program. And if I can draw your attention to tab 145 again, another graphics we offered um, a few months back. Again, just to reflect that out of 2009 and 2010, cumulative bond sales have been totaled nearly $4 billion. And what we try to show here is that is a drawdown of the various bond funds. So. We still have $1.92 billion, $22 billion in, in our bank account right now currently, but we have liquidated over $2 billion. So again, forward moving, hopefully we'll get additional commitments coming in as we will reflect next month of $488 million, $58 million, and then obviously in the priorities of funding once we start apportioning those projects and again, potential drawdown of that commitment of another $400 million. So again, 
we need to start liquidating this cash. So. Any questions? I don't have any questions on tabs five or six. That was tab five, yeah. Oh, did you want to do tab six now? Yeah, if we want to okay. do tab six. Um, tab six, stamp page 146. We are actually um, modifying this doc We've modified this document this month, and again, for the ease of um, translating it, and what does it all mean? So obviously we've been successful in this program in uh, Proposition 1D. We received 7.3 billion, excuse me, 7.3 billion in our funds. Um, what we're presenting here today is estimated unfunded approvals. We are processing 117 million this month. That represents 20.7 million in new construction. That's 11 projects. 92.8 million, and that represents 44 projects in modernization. 3.6 million, which represents 19 high performance projects, which three of them are modernization. And for Proposition 55, which is your middle column, we're processing 14 applications in new construction for 50.3 million, and also converting some quickly overcrowded school projects, 11 projects for 224 million, in addition, one charter school project for 2.1 million. And so in total, 277.4 million that we were processing unfunded <laughs> approvals for Proposition 55. And then the last bracket there, we have no activity. So this month we're processing 394.5 million of unfunded approvals. And if I can draw your attention to stamp page 147, we wanted to highlight in the emergency repair program, we're still processing unfunded approvals. We're processing 38 applications this month, which represent 15.3 million. Again, that shows the draw the need cash needed for this particular program of 93.6 million. And if I can draw your attention uh, to stamp page 148, again, the charts, again, optics easier to read. Uh, we have liquidated in Proposition 1D 52.46% of the sev out of the original $7.3 billion in the original allocation. So we've apportioned nearly $3.9 million of that, those funds, and we have over a million dollars in unfunded approvals, uh, which represents 14.31%. The reigning bond authority in Proposition 1D is 33.23%. Page 149 in Proposition 55, the original authorization was $10 billion, over $10 billion. So we have a portion in the blue, $8.9 billion, and that represents 89.05%, and we have in the maroon, unfunded approvals of 559.9 million, which represents nearly 6%. So the remaining bond authority in Proposition 55 is 536 million, which represents about 5%. 150, on page 150, Proposition 47, we have 11.4 billion in bond authority. Again, we've liquidated or apportioned 94.82 million, excuse me, 94.82 percent. We also have nearly 5 percent of unfunded approvals of 567 million and remaining bond authority left of 22.5. We have a new chart. I know we're just inundating with everybody with charts here. Our last chart, which we wanted to highlight, is um, the question of new construction, new construction authority and what we have left in new construction. So we wanted to create some new optics there. Um, Proposition 1D, 55, and 47, if you total up the entire uh, authorization for new construction, it was $14.6 billion. We have a portion out of that, $13.1 billion, which is 90% of those, uh, that commitment of authority. We still have $970 million sitting in the unfunded approvals, which represents 7% of that. We still have $400 52 million of bond authority of applications we have yet to process, so that's nearly 3% of that. So in total, we have $1.4 billion of um, authority or un unfunded approvals that, again, we need cash to back that up. So I know the question is, when do we have the level three developer fee kick in? Uh, we have, my predecessor had an opinion that was issued out of the Attorney General's office. That opinion basically summarized that this board has the authority once it has apportioned. Apportioned is a key word. So 
technically we're in, we're in a different environment. Um, we have our list. Our list is created because we have no ability to have cash, which is the result of the no AB 55 loans available. So our unfunded list is not a true unfunded list. And so until we have cash to back that up, and until this, this graphic turns close to nearly all blue, then at that point in time, I'm sure we would have a discussion about when level three developer fees kick in. So with that, I would open it up to any questions. Are there any questions from the board on those two tabs? Mr. Harvey? On your last comment, is there any reason to change our terminology on what really isn't an unfunded list based on the AG's opinion? Are we okay using that term? I think we redefined it in um, the financial hardship regulations that we put forward. Um, as far as the re-reviews, I think we redefined it as not having the ability to have cash, and so we called it, we're creating this list as a result of the AB 55 loans not being available. That's a long way of saying we're calling it something different. Right. But we're okay, you think, using the term unfunded, even though that has another implication. I believe so. I would defer to Henry. Yeah, I mean, it, it's because it's defined because we're it's pretty it's clear what we're we mean by that it's it's not an issue at this point we're not running afoul of the ag's opinion thank you very much okay any other questions or comments all right moving on to tab seven Mason Union. Barbara. barbara sorry Tab 7 is a request from the Mesa Union Elementary School District. This was previously a conceptual approval that the board made in 2007 to mitigate a health and safety issue at the Mesa Union uh, Elementary School site. This school site, uh, which was originally built in 1937 and occupied in 1939, is located adjacent to, sorry, it's located adjacent to Highway 118, which is a is a dangerous highway and was posing a problem for the students that were students and parents accessing the driveway for the school site. In addition, there were uh, natural gas, two high pressure natural gas pipelines and one high pressure crude oil pipeline located along that highway. So the area that originally had the play fields for the students was at risk. So in 2007, the conceptual approval uh, provided that the school district would purchase land adjacent to the school site so that they could move the play fields away from the dangers and it also allowed for the construction of a blast wall to protect them in case the pipeline should burst. The item here today is for two purposes. The first, the district has completed the necessary requirements and is requesting an unfunded approval at this point. And also when the item was originally approved in 2007, it was approved as a rehabilitation project, which falls under the school facility program modernization regulations. However, site acquisition and site development costs cannot be covered with modernization grants. It's prohibited in the Ed Code. So we're asking that the board shift this project from a rehabilitation project to a facility hardship project so that the school district can receive the state matching funds for the acquisition of the site and the site development. This does change the state's matching share from 60% of the project to 50% of the project. Uh, we have discussed this with the district and they are, um, they are supportive of this so that they can get the extra funding for the site acquisition and site development. If there are any questions? Would you? Are there any questions? Is there any public comment on this item? What about, is there a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to call the roll. Senator Lowenthal? Aye. Senator Huff? Aye. Assemblymember Fuller? Aye. Assemblymember Torlickson? Aye. Scott Harvey? Aye. William Ellerby? Aye. Lynn Green? Aye. Cynthia Bryant? Aye. Carries. Thank you. So now we'll make a gigantic leap to tab 12. And that's... Uh, Barbara, you're up again. Yes. <laughs> Tab 12 is a regulation amendment for the general site development grant. Uh, this grant was originally approved by the board in May of 2006. Uh, it was approved as a temporary, gra temporary grant that would allow for the complete analysis of the new construction base grant before the board decided to 
uh, determine whether or not the general site grant would remain permanently. Uh, this grant is intended to cover such costs as finished grading, driveways, playground equipment, walkways. It's in the site development category. Uh, the board has previously approved extensions three times, and we are presenting this item at this point so that it can go through the Office of Administrative Law process in time to be effective. It extends the grant um, end date from January 1st, 2011 to January 1st, 2012. Any questions? Are there any questions? Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing some public comment, Mr. Smith. This is just my day, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lyle Smoot, Los Angeles Unified again. Uh, I'm going to make another pitch. I did it last year. I'll probably be doing it next year, but uh, I don't. I don't see any reason to extend this one year at a time. Um, the general side allowance was left out of the conversion from the old program to the new, and that was a part of the recognition for establishing it in the first place. Um, and and I'd be surprised if there would ever come a time when you could justify just deleting it. And so I'm going to make a pitch again to just make it a permanent adjustment. And you know, you still have the AB 127 adjustment available to you if you, you know, and this would just be a part of the analysis for the 127 annual adjustment if, if it was permanent, just as if, as much as if it's a temporary one year at a time adjustment. So again, I'm just asking you make it permanent and be done with it. I think it's something that districts need to have knowledge is going to be there so that when you're making your planning, you know what funding you're going to get, you know, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Duffy? I'll be brief, Madam Chair. Tom Duffy for uh, Coalition for Adequate School Housing. Uh, I agree with what uh, Mr. Smoot uh, uh, just uh, testified to. And just to give you a little bit of background, the, the issue here is that when we moved from the old program in 1998 to the new program, there, there were things that, that were missed that weren't converted over. Uh, Cash did a study in the uh, uh, between 2002 and 2005, and we suggested to the board that OPSC do a study of, of the, the, the grants and the comparisons. It was This was late 2005, early 2006, and it had informed the, the bond for 2006 1, 1D in, in many ways. So that OPSC study was a good study and it was an important study. During that period of time, we kept asking the question of general site and OPSC information informed that discussion and that's why the board made the, the change. But the change was made temporarily because of a discussion between Jackie Goldberg and, and Ann Sheehy. And Ann said, can we just do it temporarily for, <laughs> take a look at this and see what it, how this is done. And Jackie agreed <coughs> and the other board members agreed. So it has been, it, in, it, in our view, it should be permanent. And we believe it was intended to be permanent. And that has not happened at this time. So what we would ask you to do uh, is to consider making it a, a a permanent part of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Did you want to respond? Sure. Um, well, it's you know it's up to the board's uh, direction. We still haven't finished the discussion with the AB 127 grant adjustments, so it's something that we could still consider in those adjustments. And if the board chose to make the regulation permanent, you could certainly do that. However, if you approve the regulations today, you're still continuing the, the option for districts to have it. So um, it's in place right now. This would just continue it for another year, which may allow for those discussions to continue so that we can provide more information. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Temporary implies that there will be some analysis as to the whys and the wherefores and the advantage of extending it. Was there ever any? study done after the first year to say this is good public policy or not, and that justified the extension. Uh, it sounds like there's consensus, this is a, a good idea. I guess I don't understand the interplay between it and this AB 127. I would hate to imbalance that somehow, but can you give me a little bit more about whether it should or should not be temporary or permanent? I think. 
Man, for an historical perspective, I'd like to defer to Dave Zian. He's been part of the program for about 20 years, so <laughs> off and on. <laughs> off and on. Yeah, there, there's been further studies. Um, and the way uh, Tom Duffy characterized that the temporary fix uh, is generally correct. Um, I'm not sure that there was ever any intent at the time that the uh, general site uh, adjustment was put in place that there was ever any intent to make it permanent. So I, I can just add that. And as far as the study, uh, there, there's been several studies and no conclusion as far as where we should go with it. So, well, just from my perspective, I'm I'm comfortable staying with the temporary with the with just doing the one year thing. I think there's lots of issues in this program that you know need to be reviewed and looked at and including the grant adequacy AB 127 and I would just say that all of that can happen and I don't see any reason necessarily it's pretty easy to do a sunset extension we do them all the time and you know upstairs oh we are upstairs um, <laughs> and so I would be comfortable just taking the staff's recommendation here but I don't know how anybody else feels I'll move staff's recommendation is there a second a second Go ahead and call the roll. Or we could, unless it, if there's no objections, we could substitute our previous roll call. Okay, we'll do that then. All right, moving on to tab 14. I would just like to note that it's 440 and we're already in the report section of our agenda. <laughs> Don't jinx it. <laughs> no, I shouldn't. This is, it can all fall apart here. <laughs> tab 14, uh, Dave. That's a lot of pressure there, Madam Chair. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, this is the latest in a series of quarterly reports in relation to the seismic mitigation program and progress in, in that program. Um, in the background, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, a discussion that was uh, at a recent SAB implementation committee meeting regarding barriers to receiving funding in the seismic mitigation program. Um, I'll quickly highlight some of the areas that, that were uh, highlighted by the stakeholders in those discussions. Uh, lack of interim housing funding should a, a building be identified as a risk. Lack of funding for a structural engineer initial assessments. On many of the district's parts, there was a concern about, do I want to spend this money for a maybe? Um, a need for more OPSC outreach in terms of uh, demystifying the program. How do you apply? What do I need to do? Do I need to go to DSA first? You know, questions like that. So that was another comment. And then lastly, financial hardship districts need upfront money for structural engineering costs, uh, architectural costs, so on. They're not even able to prime the pump and get in the, get in the pipeline without some money. They, they don't have their local share, long story short. As far as recommendations that came from the stakeholders through those discussions, um, they essentially mirrored the barriers, provide money for those areas that I mentioned that are you know, related to funding issues, and also uh, more um, the recommendation for more um, OPSC outreach. Also, there were some recommend, recommendations relating to longer term programmatic uh, issues that, that should be addressed or could be looked at. Uh, some of them related to um, uh, additional building types that could be included as eligible seismic mitigation program uh, criteria. Um, and another suggestion was maybe we throw all those out and we just rely on a structural engineer's analysis of the risk potential of a, a given building system. So that kind of summarizes that discussion. The report also goes on to note uh, the current status of an RFQ that was jointly administered by uh, the Office of Public School Construction and the Division of State Architect. We worked very closely in soliciting proposals from, from a number of uh, structural engineering firms. We were successful in uh, selecting a southern uh, contractor and a northern contractor. And the contract is designed to do two things. One, to provide a streamlined uniform template to determine the risk potential of given building systems out there. And secondarily for the contract provides money for the structural engineers in the north and south to actually go out and provide free reviews to requesting school districts that would like the assistance to evaluate the, uh, the condition of their buildings and whether or not they could qualify for seismic mitigation program funding. The report also talks about the 77 number that has been thrown around, tossed about pretty loosely at numerous meetings. Uh, that was a snapshot at a given time based on available information. The DSA and OPSC have 
since that time, since that period, winnowed it down through surveys, outreach, various, uh, various discussions with different districts. And it is, that number is now 48. And the reason it's shrunk is due to just additional information that's been provided related to the conditions of these buildings. You know, students and staff may not be entering some of these buildings, which renders them uh, ineligible for funding. Uh, the buildings may have been demolished or they may have been retrofitted, those kinds of things had influencing inf uh, factors on the buildings. And then also I should note that we looked at the 48 buildings that are currently eligible in terms of the RFQ and we solicited the districts on that 48 list. We looked at the state and templated the current seismic mitigation program eligibility criteria. It went from 1.7 to 1.68 recently as you'll recall, hopefully you'll recall or if you don't that's that's something that was recently adopted in the seismic mitigation program regs and there were additional building types added also as a part of that reg change. But we looked at those buildings that are, that are currently perceived to be potentially eligible and solicited the school districts for their interest in this contract if we were entering into a contract. And there are 16 districts that comprise those 48 um, buildings on that list and seven of the districts on that list indicated an interest and those comprise 24 buildings. So there is money, long story short, in the RFQ that I talked about earlier to cover those visits by structural engineers to perform an analysis of the buildings. And then lastly, the report talks about the uh, current status of what has come in so far. DSA has reviewed and approved six uh, structural um, evaluation reports relating to, to this program and the OPSC has processed three of them and they're contained in the report here, the three. And there are another three then we're waiting for to come in. So they're in various stages. And there is one that's currently in process that we're going back and forth with on paperwork. So we look to this action and, and the RFQ to hopefully spur on uh, additional new activity and subscribe more of the funding in that program. Are there any questions? Any questions? I think. Oh, Mr. Harvey, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I view this as a very positive report uh, in that I think you've acknowledged how we've removed and addressed a handful of the barriers. Uh, we've gotten money to help school districts pay for that structural engineering. No longer do they upfront it and on, on a maybe. We're paying for it. We've added building types. We've loosened the shake zone criteria, all in an effort to qualify more districts so we can try to get this money out. The one missing ingredient that I think we can address as, uh, as a board and, and staff most certainly is this question of outreach, making sure folk are aware of it. And I think the other part of it, which I would encourage you to analyze the merits of, is to target financial hardship districts because obviously there's no match required and that can be an impediment. If you do a hardship district, we pay for it all. And the second thing is to do that due diligence, reminding districts that if they marry up the seismic work with their modernization, you get more bang for the buck. So I would encourage you to take a look at those two things as a way of stimulating and moving this money. We've, we've seen it sit we know their liabilities. We're trying to create safer schools for kids. And I think it's incumbent upon us to take a hold of that other missing ingredient. The one remaining one <laughs> uh, is whether or not this program should pay for temporary housing. We haven't had that policy discussion debate. Um, and of course, uh, y you add that to the list of things we pay for, it certainly doesn't go to retrofitting schools, but it's it's the one policy discussion we haven't had. But I want to thank you for um, keeping this on our agenda because I think the board felt that this, along with the high performance, were two well-intended programs, and yet they were not being accessed. And let's make sure we did things to remove barriers, and I think this is an example of how we've done that. So thank you. And I think, um, when do we put this schedule to come back in? End of August or August 4th? August 4th. Um, we're kind of wrapping this around um, the priorities and funding subcommittee item. Um, I, one of the items that were left it, as far as uh, that meeting was concerned was identifying facility hardship 
I think Ms. Moore wanted to have a more broader policy discussion in that area. And I think by this action too, moving forward with those school districts identifying these particular school, you know, locations of having a scarlet letter on them, you know, perhaps we can wrap that same discussion for seismic. Is that going to be a potentially a policy discussion? Is it a priority as well? Right. So I, in my discussions with staff, um, I've asked them to consult with um, Senator Hancock and also Ms. Moore on both of those issues because I think they both have very strong feelings and, and as we talked through the issues, we found them to be quite related and so I think we can bring back a, a solid, you know, just have a really robust policy discussion at our next meeting on, on both of those issues. Right. And that's what we plan to do. Okay, are there any questions on that report? Okay, then we'll move on to tab 15. I think that's also you, Dave. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, page 177, tab 15, is our latest uh, report of the State Relocatable Classroom Program. Um, it is a snapshot of where we are right now currently on the phase out of the uh, program that was approved by the board back in October of 2005. Um, where we are exactly in terms of buildings out there are 306, and the report talks about various pots that these 306 buildings fall into. We have 161 buildings <laughs> currently under lease, and the leases expire as of 831. So we will be solic soliciting input from various practitioners out there relative to whether they want to buy these buildings or they want us to come get them. And then we'll have to find another buyer or someone to take the buildings at that point. There's a, another 145 buildings. That's the other part of the 306 figure I first threw out. And of those buildings, uh, 93 are, uh, are basically have uh, school districts requesting a purchase of those buildings. And the other 53 have districts essentially telling us, come get the buildings. We do not want the buildings. So we'll have to find um, buyers for that. So relative to, to this inventory and things we're doing, I'll quickly update you. We've done a, a webcast soliciting input from all the practitioners, school districts, charter schools, and outside entities um, asking them if they're interested in purchasing the buildings. That's, that's one thing in play. Uh, we have a gentleman out uh, uh, inventorying the buildings, taking pictures, getting them ready in terms of you know, their condition. Um, depending on whether we have takers or not to determine what are the costs associated with liquidating these buildings. And we have had uh, some interest from outside entities, I can tell you right now, with Department of Corrections and believe it or not, the San Francisco Zoo indicated interest. So there is interest in these buildings. We're, we're right now compiling a list of interested buildings and hopefully we get to the point where we liquidate all the buildings very easily. And we have a backup plan in case that doesn't work. So. Uh, long story short, when we get beyond all that inventory and the various pots that they fall into and how to liquidate them most expeditiously, uh, we'll be determining a final budget because there are some ancillary costs obviously associated with these buildings if we have to move them or refurbish them or so on, those kinds of things. The last part of the report deals with the funding in the program and there was some questions about what was the uh, fiscal year 2009-10 dollars that were generated through leases and through the sale of buildings and that amount was 1.4 million for that fiscal year that did it, by the way, we're in that still, it's, it's the last week of that fiscal year. And in terms of the actual cash on hand for the program right now, we have 30.1 million available of which the 1.4 million is a subset of that. And that dollar, that dollar amount that I mentioned, the 30.1 million really is a, is a representation of over time all the leases and sales of these buildings so that is accumulated. So. So that is the report. Are there any questions? Any questions? Mr. Torlakson? Appreciate the report. Um, is it correct uh, that the funds uh, can be programmed by this board? Or what, what's the flexibility in the funds? And is, I'm thinking there, if, if that's true, to have the item brought back at some point to discuss what we may want to do in terms of any particular way to invest the dollars, whether it's to provide assistance in an emergency, earthquake, fire, or other other ideas of places where that money could be targeted once the program's wound down. Silverman. It's a, yeah. I know we've, we've allocated money in the past uh, for various uses. I know we, we did uh, transfer some money 
15.5 million was the last transfer was for joint use, and I believe that was no 607. So obviously there's um, an item that we need to reconcile first is, is what the cost moving forward for the program. But I believe at that point in time, we will be better have a better understanding of what we can present as far as dollar wise are concerned. And then again, have a robust discussion of, of what we what we move forward. And that's actually slated in our workload report as well as a follow up item. So okay, Ms. Fuller. So is there any estimation of how many buildings are usable that we might be liquidating? That are actually able when usable. Usable. We have right now 146 that are usable and ready to be sold. Okay. And that number could change. It's a snapshot okay. right now in time. And so do you have any predictions about what percentage I, I'm just concerned, are we is there a lot of stock to be liquidated? in some form other than selling at its current value? I, I, I can't answer that other than to say we're, we're in that due process right now of, of determining exactly the answer to your question. Okay, so, so be unsafe to try to answer right would now. we, are we gonna be appraised that before we get to that place? In other words, I, I don't wanna be responsible for liquidating a lot of stuff at a below market level because we didn't know as a board. Um, there's at when we get to the end and we know exactly how many we need to liquidate uh, we will decide how we will liquidate them uh, one of the plan B's that I alluded to was to sell them uh, kind of like on an online auction you know mm -hmm. to the best price hopefully that wouldn't you know be a below market value type price um, we have to realize that these buildings are at different ages they're in different conditions so that's part of the our due diligence right now in inspecting these buildings to to see what kind of you know condition they're actually in school districts are required to maintain the buildings in good working order the problem is some of these buildings as I mentioned earlier are not currently under lease so what has happened from the point at which they were under lease and required to be maintained and where we are today so that's that's part of the the equation here so I hope that helps but you'll bring that back, kind of an inventory. We will back bring it back, and we will we will have a full report on uh, what the costs associated with that is, and the kinds of dollars that are coming in from the sale of these. Great. Then I'm requesting um, a full inventory, um, and with particular interest on like some categories of uh, how much it's going to cost us to bring them up, or what we're thinking about liquidating. In other words, <clears throat> as a school district. These buildings were really valuable to all of us. They really were very valuable, and I hate to see the program going if you want to know the truth. <clears throat> but they are extremely expensive to maintain as well. And so I don't want us suddenly dumping a lot of buildings out on the market for an undervalued price that aren't going to school districts just so we get like a little bit of cash to throw in some pot someplace else. I think that would be unwise. So I would like enough information to be able to determine <clears throat> if we are um, able to sell these at sort of market value and if there are some that are not able to be brought up to market value, you know, what, what we're going to do with them that might first benefit school districts um, before we go dump them on the open market. Mr. Harvey. As a segue, you said something very interesting, David, which was by lease, the school districts have an obligation to maintain them in good working order. If the board is concerned about undervalued properties that because they haven't been maintained, and you talked about our obligation to repair them, what can we require via this lease that the school districts do to maintain them in working order so that it is not a cost out of this program, but they are doing what they've been asked to do, which is to maintain it. The realities are we, we do have a lease. For the buildings that are currently under lease, we, we can um, execute that provision of the lease, ask the school district, the gentleman's going out looking at the buildings, you know, certain things that need to be repaired. If there's a dispute, that's where you get into the dance. And I'll be honest with you, it takes time to work these issues out. Um, but, but that's, that's part of the complication here with it. So we need to, first of all, determine what the problem is, what needs to be addressed, and 
and what the best solution is. So all the more reason to bring it back here because this yes. board may decide, well, this it's well the state should eat it. Well, wait a minute. In this case, the district should eat it. I mean, those are the kind of directions that may be helpful to you. But there was some number of buildings that were. There was some number of buildings that were not under lease that, that the state currently owns, and so is that a large number of the 146? Yeah, that, that number is 145. Of the total inventory, we have 306 that we're currently dealing with as a universe, and we have 161 under lease and 145 that are currently not under any lease, and those are the ones I'm more yes. concerned about. I have yes. really not as much legal latitude to talk with districts about, hey, you didn't maintain that. You know, as time goes on, yeah, it's a slippery that. slope on these buildings. I understand. You know? so, 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 yeah, basically I think it would be very good for us to have an, a status report and an inventory before we sure. get too further. Like, given that half of the inventory is in a questionable state. we Will do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that? Okay, that's, that concludes our um, item. Did you want to highlight anything in the um, information section? Other than our next meeting is August 4th, and right. we have two meetings in August scheduled, so. Right, I just want to remind everybody, on August 4th, we have a meeting, and then we have another one on August 25th. But August 4th, we're going to do the apportionments on our priorities and funding program. We have a hard, a hard agenda, so um, I'm letting you out early today. Um, <laughs> and is there any public item? comment on items not on the agenda. We need to remember to put that on the, that was left off the, we have to remember to put that on the agenda, public comment. Okay, then with that, we will adjourn this in record time.